So Nick moved through the program and he can probably shed some light on that. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I don't know if you have it handy, Nick, or if you remember, but sort of when you joined the program, when you landed your job, um, yeah. so people get a feel for about how long you've been, you know, in a Salesforce consulting position at this point. Yeah, sure. So I had first heard of Salesforce, like period, when you did that first podcast with Choose FI. So that was like probably a couple of years ago now. Um, and then I heard of the program in maybe December of 2020. Uh, I had signed up by the be beginning of January. Uh, I got started with the program officially uh, first, second week of January. I got my admin certification in early March uh, and started on the volunteer project about a week after that. And at the same time, I was starting to send out applications to lots of different places. And within a couple of weeks, I'd started getting some responses and had my first interview. Uh, my first day on the job was May 9th, was my official start date. So, uh, you know, all in all, it was, I guess, a little over five months from when I signed up for the program to when I started my first day at my new job. Yeah. And so now you've been there just for, uh, to sort of paint the picture for everyone. So. It, based on those dates, you've been in this role for about four months now. So you're newer, but you're not totally fresh anymore. You've definitely had to sort of pick up the reins and figure it out. Um, and I, I, I think that that gives a lot of uh, color to the conversation, I think. So you were in the program about five months. Um, obviously, we still see you around hanging out and helping other yeah. people. And obviously, you're here tonight. So we, we certainly appreciate that. Um, for anyone just joining, feel free to drop any questions in the chat. Uh, whenever you're ready, and we'll sort of feed those in as they uh, work into the conversation a little bit. Um, so I'll sort of kick things off um, for the sake of sort of carrying the storyline of this conversation. Uh, so tell us a little bit about, you know, you said you heard about Salesforce, that would have been on Choose FI a couple of years ago, like, like you mentioned. Um, so what really interested you in Salesforce? What made you think, you know, currently I'm a letter carrier? And I think I might like to be a Salesforce professional. What, what made that click for you? Yeah, so it was obviously a little bit of a journey to get there, right? First having heard it, you know, like two years prior to actually taking action on it. Um, it was probably honestly a lot of choose FI and like changing my mindset about money and finances and opening my eyes to like what opportunities there could be out there in terms of increasing my flexibility, um, my adaptability, like how resilient I was. And, um, you know, just in those like sort of two years, I had already started going on like sort of a financial journey transformation uh, that QZFI helped with a ton. And then when I sort of heard that message, you know, a couple years later, I was just in a different mindset and I was starting to think that I could sort of do more I was like I was like selling into being a letter carrier like this was just what I did and that was just how it was going to be and that was fine and I was going to do this for like 30 years and then retire with like a government pension and stuff like that but it was just more of a mindset change and I will say that I have a lot less time to listen to podcasts now so I've listened to a lot less choose fi because I'm not walking around all day um but it was definitely just constantly having that sort of message reinforced in my head for those years so that when I heard that you had had sort of this more structured program that you developed, I was in a place where I was more ready to sort of take on that challenge, I think. Yeah, that's excellent. And so for those of you sort of hearing Nick and then looking at the the live comments here and seeing people saying like, yeah, choose a fires. Um, yeah. If you're not aware, Choose FI is a it's a financial independence podcast specifically. Um, so if you are interested in uh, similarly improving your life through your own personal finances and things like that, I would I would highly recommend checking out the Choose FI podcast. Um, uh, I'm not getting paid to to put them in here. It's just it's no. also changed my life um, tr tremendously, and uh, yeah, it's it's definitely worth checking out. Um, so, so you, you get to that point where you, you, you hear about Salesforce on a podcast and you're sort of working through your own personal finances and you're getting in this very stable, safe place where you can see, okay, I've got some power over what I'm doing in my life right now. I don't have to sit in this current career that I'm in just because it feeds me a paycheck. I have options at this point. And you're looking back at the Salesforce options and then you see that we have a course available and you're like, okay, I think, I think this could be pretty cool. Um, so you go that direction and 
what was it like for you? I, I guess, what, what do you feel that you overcame? Was there anything that uh, stood out to you as, I'm not sure if I can do this, sort of the imposter syndrome? Am I really going to be a, a Salesforce consultant or professional? Um, did you ever doubt any of that? Or did you have a pretty good feeling you, you felt you could do this? No, I absolutely did. <laughs> um, and I think part of that exercise was sort of um, having those feelings and then doing it anyway. Mm. Um, you know, and I think that was pretty motivating to me when I felt like, like, so I'll give an example, like LinkedIn was not very intuitive to me. I did not like, like that. I was like, I really don't feel comfortable with like social media in general. Like I'm not really on Facebook. I made a LinkedIn in college because someone told me I should and never touched it again. So I was like not excited to like put myself out there like that. But um, I told myself I pay for this program. I'm going to listen to this guy's advice and I'm just <laughs> going to do it even if it makes me uncomfortable or I'm like not super excited about it. And that's what I did. And LinkedIn was probably the biggest example of that because I'm not I don't love putting myself out there like that, but yeah. So to answer your question, yes, I felt like at some points, like this is dumb. Like this, is this LinkedIn stuff really going to like help? Does anyone really use it? Blah, 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 blah. And then I just said, I'm going to do it anyway, because this guy told me to. And I think that's part of the benefit of the program, to be honest, is like, if you just like put aside whatever your notions are and just buy into it, yeah. both literally buy into it because we obviously pay to be a part of the program. Um, but then just realize, you know, you're paying for this advice and this guidance. So just suck it up and follow it, even if it makes you uncomfortable. And that's pretty much what I did. Yeah. I think that's a, that's an interesting, um, characteristic of your journey. I think is that we, we do see that sometimes when people join the program, they, they sort of pick and choose what they want to use. And the whole point of it is that it's, it's comprehensive. It's a, it's a snowballed effect where when you take all these bits and pieces and you put them, them together, you get an outcome. Yeah. Um, but when you pick and choose the things that you're comfortable with, or you think will work. And, and sometimes we have people who approach us and they say, Hey, Brad, do you sell just the volunteer project? Or do you sell just the, the part where you help me with interviews and our typical response is, well, the response is no, but typically what we say is you'll, you'll be interested to find that the things you think are the problem may not actually be your biggest hurdle to overcome. And once you understand the comprehensive side of this, you're going to be in a much better place when you're putting all these things together, not just picking the things you think are your problem, basically. Sure. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's smart. Um, at least give it a shot, right? I mean, you, you spent yep. the money on it. You may as exactly. well see if it works. Um, and, yeah, uh, go ahead. And I'll add also, just because you bring up like spending the money, that was also like a big motivating factor because like a lot of people who found the program through Choose FI, I'm pretty frugal and I don't mm -hmm. part for my money easily. And honestly, when I signed up, even I, I literally told myself, even if I get nothing, even if I don't get the value that I would say comes with that price tag, mm -hmm. just the act of me paying for the program and money leaving my hands was going to motivate me to follow through. Yeah, that I think that, like, and, you know, is that, that that's me too, exact same mindset, yeah. because I come from a financial independence background and a super frugal family. And um, and I felt the same way from the other side. It was like, if I'm going to ask people for their money, I'm going to deliver. Like the, yeah. I'm, I'm not just going to take their money. This has got to deliver. Um, so that was a lot of pressure and it, it still is, but it's a, it's a healthy pressure, I think. Um, so we, we've got a few questions here and I'll, I'll try to feed these in as they make sense. Um, so I, I want to start with the uh, sort of getting the certification process and I think this this process of going from I'm not sure what Salesforce is or I'm I'm lightly interested to getting a Salesforce job. There's a lot of steps in between, and we'll get into LinkedIn and sort of the things you talked about there. Um, but the certification is is per hour process. The the first thing you want to do. So there's a couple things that fold into this. Um, so I think first thing, going through that certification process. A lot of the feedback we get early on when people first join is. I don't know if I'm cut out for this. Like I just got on trailhead and I'm trying to get this ridiculously hard security specialist, super bad. Why is the <laughs> hardest one? The first one, I still don't know. Um, and 
they just beat themselves up over, okay, I got the super badge, but I still don't understand it. Or I think I'm scoring okay on these practice exams, but I don't quite know what's going on here. Um, did, did you have some of those same feelings? And, and I guess, how did you, um, how did you stabilize those feelings and, and make sure that you were continuously, I guess, bringing the com- the confidence that, all right, I don't get it all today, but I, I still think I'm on the right track. Yeah. Um, so first it gets easier. The first super badge is the hardest hurdle. Um, every other super badge is easier. Um, and then the other thing I would say is just pacing yourself, um, not to get burnt out. So like I would try and consistently do like one badge a day. You know, I would do like a couple modules in the morning and like a couple modules in the evening because I was working full time. So like, I also like have full time job. I couldn't spend eight hours a day studying. Um, so I felt like pacing yourself was really important. And I think the pacing guide is a great start to that. I think I went a little faster than the pacing guide. Um, but if you just go slow and say, you'll get there. Um, first stuff is the hardest. It gets so much easier. Once you start to like put the pieces together, which might not happen even until like you're at the end of the trail mix or you start the volunteer project. The volunteer project was really big for just putting like taking what you sort of learned in trailhead and trying to apply it and like actually having to do the critical thinking about how to apply it is like a very different learning process than just going through trailhead. So it's okay to not feel like everything's clicking right away. Just keep moving. Um, Focus on force is huge. Uh, for taking the Salesforce test. Um, I can't imagine passing it without focus on force, to be honest. It was a really, really valuable resource. So I'm definitely plug that. Um, But yeah, once you get to the volunteer project stage, like you put in the work to pass the test, it will start clicking then because you'll be forced to apply it in real situations. So yeah, yeah, I think that's spot on. Do you you have any, um, do you have any specific tips or advice? So, So we just heard a couple. It was um, when you're going through, don't worry if it's not all making hundred percent sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, we heard the focus on force, you know, be, having access to those practice exams and being able to evaluate yourself, um, is huge. Um, just staying positive and trying to pace yourself and getting a couple of modules in, in the morning and the evening, um, when, when you have time, obviously, Um, so those are a lot of great tips. Is there anything outside of that? Like, did you take notes in a specific way? Did you, were you in a study group? Is there anything else, um, to add some color to what you think might've made a difference to, to make the struggle not as hard for the the, the next person who goes down that path? Yeah. One more thing I would add to that list is definitely feel okay. Stepping away, Hmm. especially when you start tackling the super badges, because I can't tell you how many times I would be stuck on a step in a super badge you know, I'd be staring at the screen for three, four hours, trying to work through it. I step away, come back the next day or a couple of days later. And within like 10 minutes, it's like, oh, I just have to do this. Mm-hmm. So give yourself like the space to step away from your computer for a while and come back with a fresh set of eyes. Because I think a lot of us in the program are like in a very sprinting mindset, which is like fine. We're super moving. We want to get done and we want to go really mm-hmm. fast and we want to get the volunteer project and land the job and like just accelerate everything. But in the grand scheme of things, it's really okay to take a few days or take a week um, and just come back fresher. So don't be afraid to do that. Even though you, you feel like there's this pressure to like move through the program at a certain pace, but like there isn't any, that's like just you applying that pressure. So give yourself yeah. some credit to do that. Yeah, that's tough. And I think you bring up a really good point. I, I think about that a lot too. And I know that I try to put myself in the shoes of the members and, and members are different too. There's some people who are yep. um, by choice unemployed. They've, they've decided to wait to, you know, maybe they got laid off during the pandemic or something happened with their company and they've decided to be unemployed and, you know, gain unemployment while they're going through the program. There's some people who are unemployed and don't want to be And they are just battling to get to that job as fast as possible. And there are some people who are just burnt out at their jobs and they they can't stand the fact of going into work on Monday. And so there's so many different paths that are happening there. Um, And you're, you're absolutely right, though. In the grand scheme of things, making... I'll just use the average that for the program, making like $70,000 a year today 
it's not that big of a deal if that happens to this month or next month. It's not a yeah. huge deal in the grand scheme of the next five, 10, 20 years. Yeah. Um, so don't put that much pressure on yourself if you don't have to. Now, if you need a job because you need a paycheck <laughs> because you need to pay your bills, I get it. The pressure's there. Focus, get it done. Um, but otherwise, if you're working a full-time job and you're taking care of the family and maybe aging parents or other obligations, you should give yourself a give yourself a breather. This doesn't have to happen tomorrow. Um, so I, I think that's great advice. Um, so this feeds into a, another question here. Now you've answered part of it because we know you did maintain your full time job while going through the program, right? Um, how many hours a week do you think you were dedicating, and how to, how did you fit that into your schedule? Yeah, um, honestly, I think I think that like sort of. 10 to 12 hours a week, which I think is like pretty much exactly what like, you sort of advertise as like being the approximate like time commitment. I think that's like about right. Cause I think I would spend like maybe an hour, like most weeknights and more on the weekends. Mm -hmm. Um, especially if I was like up to a super badge point, mm -hmm. but like maybe 10 to 15 hours is about where it would be depending on the week. Okay. And I've got a question that this is not a user submitted question. This is a me question. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, do, what do you think, did the time commitment change at all after you got the certification? Um, and can you talk about the pressure? Cause I know for a lot of people, there's a lot of pressure as they're studying for and trying to get that certification, especially if they failed it once or twice and now the pressure is building like, okay, I got to get over this hurdle. Um, can you talk about the time commitment and the pressure before you get certified? And then for you personally, the time commitment and the pressure after you got certified and how that changed? Yeah. Um, Cause you're in a different phase, say, right? Yeah, it's definitely different. I would say I, if anything, I spent a little bit less time or like my time was spent differently, right? So mm -hmm. after I got certified, I was working on the volunteer project. Um, honestly, that was, less than 10 hours a week, I would say I put into the volunteer project for the most part. And then at that point, you know, the program, you're applying for jobs and I think, and preparing for interviews and things like that. And I think that's sort of a different uh, mentality and like mental commitment than studying for an exam. So it was like easy to like watch TV and scroll through Indeed or like LinkedIn and stuff like that. And like just like look for jobs. And I didn't have to be like as focused all the time on that. Mm -hmm. um, so it was definitely less. And it was also just different. Cause I think, like you said, like the, the just the phase of the program is just different. So you have a little bit more mental space okay. um, than just like studying all the time. Yeah. And that, that's the way I see it too, but I'm seeing it from the outside, right? I'm not, I'm not personally studying for the exam and then switching yeah. over to applying for jobs. So I kind of felt like that's the way it would be, but I'm not hundred percent sure. And I know some people, um, especially if they are incredibly nervous about interviews and things like that, then there can be a different type of sort of this overwhelming pressure once they get past the certification. Um, so an, another thing here, okay. So this is another question. Um, now that we're sort of at this point in the process, would you recommend that people, as soon as they get that certification, go ahead and start applying for jobs or knowing that they're going to get assigned to a volunteer project in the next couple of weeks. And that's going to start. How would you typically recommend people at what point in time would you say, you know, I think I would go ahead and start, start applying for jobs around this point. I right away, like the day after I started applying for jobs almost because maybe not literally the day after, but like definitely in the next couple of days, I just started applying because the absolute worst case outcome is you apply to a job that you would have missed anyway, right? Like if you wait to apply for another month until the volunteer project is started, that job's already going to be filled. So you're going to lose that opportunity. And the absolute worst thing that happens is you are not prepared for the interview. You don't have the hands-on experience yet, uh, but you struggle through the interview and you get hands-on experience with the interviews. And like, that's really valuable in and of itself. Best case scenario, it goes super well and you land a job. So for me, I feel like there's no downside to yeah. just applying for jobs. And that's pretty much what I did. Yeah. And the first job interview I had was maybe like a week after I had started the, the volunteer project. And as soon as I started the volunteer project, um, I like went through, I looked at all the requirements. 
Um, I forget if you had like broken down into like categories like reports and security and like user setup and stuff like that. And I, but I literally looked at all the requirements we had and I said like on my resume, uh, t you know, volunteer project, here's what I did. Even though I hadn't actually done it yet, sure. but I wasn't necessarily like expecting to get responses right away. So I figured, mm -hmm. oh, by the time I get like a hit and like we get an interview set up, like I'll be like a few weeks into the volunteer project. Mm -hmm. so I'll be able to talk to these a little bit better, but I wanted it on my resume anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And I did land an interview a few weeks, maybe even two weeks into the volunteer project, like very, very early on. Mm -hmm. So I really had to like think carefully about how I want to present that. Um, uh, the volunteer project to them because I hadn't actually done a lot of the stuff I put on my resume, mm -hmm. even though mm -hmm. I knew I would be doing it. Mm -hmm. So I sort of framed it as like an ongoing process. Like I'm part of a team and we're working on this project and we're in the process of gathering requirements and we're going to be building these reports and just sort of like framing it in a very positive way and not so much like you lie because you're not really lying like you are doing those things even if you haven't like finished doing them um yeah. so definitely apply it like right away i think yeah i don't i don't disagree with that it's a it's a balancing act at that point like right when you're in that pivotal moment um and i really like this question actually i really like a lot of these questions because these are like spot on to the things that i would want to talk about so it's awesome that people <laughs> are asking um that is it's really when you're thinking of this from an efficiency perspective, like, are we going to streamline this approach? Now, if you wanted to just take it in bite-sized chunks, of course you could say, okay, well, I'm going to wait till I finish the volunteer project totally. And then I'm going to start applying for jobs and interviewing, but that's a very, um, I don't want to call it inefficient. It's still pretty darn efficient. It's just not as efficient yeah, as it could exactly. be. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting approach. I think if it were me personally, I would have done the same thing you did. Um, I get the gray area of, are you lying on your resume right now? Because you haven't quite done it, but it's such a thin line. You're walking where you could apply for a job and it could be a week later. They say, we've got your application. We'd like to get you on an interview next week. And then they do a phone screening and then they yeah. get you on a real interview yep. week three. And by that point, you're halfway through your volunteer project and you can really talk about experience from that standpoint. Um, so I think I would start applying right away, especially if I get that email from the project coordinator and my project's about to kick off and I've got my team assigned. At that point, I'm pretty comfortable saying, okay, I need to start applying for jobs because the rubber's going to hit the road with my experience. And I'll be able to talk about that in my interviews by the time, you know, yeah. those are actually scheduled. Um, so I, I think that that efficiency play ma makes a lot of sense in my eyes. Yeah. And for what's worth, like, I don't think, so I had that one interview that was fairly early on. And the first interview is usually a very behavioral, like general sort of interview mm -hmm. also. Like, you know, I mentioned, you know, I obviously talked about Talent Stack and I talked about the volunteer project and like what we were doing, but, I, but they weren't interested. That HR person wasn't super interested in like diving into the details. Uh, so there are like stages to the interview process and you have a little bit of time. And like I said, the worst case scenario is you get practice and, you know, that's great. <laughs> yeah, it's really valuable. And I'll, I'll just say to anyone going through those interviews and you're like, yeah, it's great practice, but I just got told no, like that hurts. And it, it does hurt. You're going to get an, told no. Yeah. It's that's an emotional good practice too. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, and, and I, I ha it has occurred to me that, you know, when people used to ask, um, who shouldn't, you know, be interested in Salesforce. And then, you know, I, I sort of had some of these back pocket answers, but I, I didn't really know the characteristics. Um, but I have found that who should be interested in Salesforce or what attribute or characteristic might you need, uh, for this particular journey. Um, and I've sort of called it like emotional stability or maturity, and it's this ability to deal with those situations. And are they going to hurt? Like when somebody says, Hey, we found somebody with more experience or, Hey, you're just not what we're looking for. That's going to hurt. Like it sucks. It takes the wind out of your cells, but you just have to sort of look at it, learn what you can from that experience, come back to the members only group and say, Hey, this happened. Does anybody have any tips or advice? And everyone's going to rally around you. So use it as a learning opportunity. Every time you fail, I mean, truly, I know it's, I know it's cliche, but it's a learning opportunity and you've got a whole community here to to help you get the most out of that learning opportunity. 
Yeah, and Justin has a great example, right, where he says, like, for, you know, if you it takes you 20 interviews and you, like, take the average value of each of those interviews, it's like you can walk away with any interview and say, like, okay, I don't have the money in my pocket, mm -hmm. but I know that that's just, like, one down. And if it takes me 10 more to do it, that's just, like, all part of the process and you can still yep. take value from those interviews. Yep, that's right. They're, they're all, it's just the investment you're putting in up front before yep. you cash out. And um, as long as you're growing from them, right? You can't come yes. out of every failure in an interview and just go, ah, whatever. It was their fault. It has nothing to do with me. I'm fine. <laughs> um, you have to learn something from that and try to grow from it. And then you're going to get maximum value out of that prep. Um, so we've got a few different uh, questions here. We've got a few questions about consulting and things like that. I want to hold those until we get to that part in the story progression. I'm trying to lead this through, um, as most of you can probably tell. So I'd like to talk now, um, you know, there's a few things that come into play at this point. You've gotten certified, you're applying for jobs. You told us a lot about the interview side of things. Um, but there's two pieces that I want to talk about here and it's your branding. Um, and you may have a different word for that, whatever you want to call that, but basically your presence on LinkedIn and how you present yourself. Um, and I want to talk about the volunteer project and what edge you feel that gave you and what, you know, um, and how that added to your confidence. So let's start with, with LinkedIn, because I know you talked earlier in this conversation about how that made you maybe a little uncomfortable or apprehensive about that part of the process. And it's LinkedIn really, you know, what Brad's making it out to be like, is it really going to make that big of a difference? And, um, so yeah, if you wouldn't mind just sharing your experience with LinkedIn and any, you know, sort of pro tips you have for members of the program. Sure. So follow the advice in the program. <laughs> I mean, there's not like a lot to it. Like I'm not a particularly creative, like LinkedIn personal brander. Like all I did was follow the advice of the program, um, reached out to tons of people, even if it made me uncomfortable. And like a lot of people didn't respond, but some people did. And that's what matters. Um, you only need like one person, like you only need one person to connect with. That's going to make the difference. So just do it. Um, I will say, I think I had two job interviews that came like directly from LinkedIn. Um, one of which I didn't even, I didn't end up going to because it was happening like around the same time I was accepting my offer. Mm. But I think two, two, in I had two interview opportunities that were purely based off of just being present on LinkedIn, on LinkedIn and like reaching out to people. Um, and then the other thing I'll say about that is that you don't know when those connections are going to come back. So an example is I just had someone reach out to me on LinkedIn who I had talked to months and months ago, who reached back out to me and said, like, asked if I was still like looking, mm -hmm. if I was like happy, like, like, you know, like they'll come back to like sort of court you because mm -hmm. once you land that first job, all of a sudden you're super attractive mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and everyone wants to talk to you now. Um, but yeah, so just be, be present, follow the advice in the program, um, post about anything you're doing, Salesforce related, um, community groups, uh, trailblazer events, whatever that badge is you got. Um, if you go to, like events like this with talent stacker, like post about like anything you can post on there that shows that you're super engaged and involved in the Salesforce community, mm -hmm. um, is only going to help you. Yeah, I think I think that's that's great advice. And that network, to to your point, you you just never know when it's going to activate or when it's going to come through for you. Um, so so you just never know when this is going to come through for you. And it might be job number one. It might be job number four. Um, and and it's important to uh, be part of those. I know uh, one of our members got declined from a job, and he went you know beyond the advice that I give, and he actually continued to follow the recruiter and help her share job postings for more advanced roles and roles that weren't even for Salesforce and just helping promote her. And sure enough, as soon as she got another junior admin role, she said, Hey, look, you've been, you know, really supportive of me and what I'm doing. I personally want to get you into this role. That's um, great. So it's, it's really cool when you truly put yourself out there and truly show positive energy and support other people, they will want to bring you forward. Um, so I, I, I think that's really good advice. And I just wanted to highlight that. Um, so coming out of sort of the personal branding and LinkedIn, the volunteer project, what do you, 
what did that do for you personally? Like outside of, yes, I'm sure it made you more marketable or like interesting having that experience on your resume, but what did it do for you psychologically? Did it help you sort of overcome any barriers and, and feel a little bit more comfortable putting yourself out there? So like I said earlier, the volunteer project is where things really start to come together and it's where the imposter syndrome starts to fade away. Like, you know, as you're going through trailhead and you're preparing for your certification, that's one sort of sort of Salesforce training and knowledge and studying. Um, but applying those concepts in a more free form way, um, you know, like the super badges are great, but they're still like relatively prescriptive. Like there's, you know, path you follow and you can, you know, find a lot of help online and trailblazer communities. But um, on the volunteer project where you have uh, like a whole sandbox and it's really up to you to decide like what direction you want to go um, really solidifies your knowledge and lets you talk about things a lot more fluently because you have actual experience now. Um, so I would say it's more, it's, it's a real confidence booster having that experience. And that just lets you present yourself in a much more competent way in interviews. Yeah. Yeah. That that's great. And, 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 and I'll say for people who are maybe, maybe you're still working on your certification and the volunteer projects, you know, a few weeks out or maybe a month or two out, um, or those of you who may have just gotten certified and you're about to get on a volunteer project, you might be in your volunteer project right now. Be really thoughtful about those because it's huge. It's a, it's a cornerstone of the program for a reason. Um, it's not just a resume builder. So many people think, okay, I just need to get on the project and I'll sit in the back seat and just be along for the ride. And I'll just put it on my resume and I'll be good to go. That's part of the point, but that's not the point that that's, that's a piece of it. The, you want to be able to tell stories in interviews. Um, you want to actually polish your skills. Uh, you want to impress your project coordinator and your team members because they could be a letter of recommendation or a reference for you in the future. Um, you want to actually build your ability to work on a team and get things done to improve your confidence, like Nick said. And then when you walk into these interviews and someone's questioning your experience or questioning your ability, you have things to say rather than just feeling like, oh man, they figured it out that I don't have experience. Like you want to be able to confidently say, no, I think I do have the experience you're looking for. And maybe I didn't showcase that enough. Let me tell you a story about uh, the project I worked on and how I worked with the team to actually implement a solution for a company in need. This is what we did and show them the value you have and riding in the backseat and just listing it on your resume. It's not going to help you nearly as much as, you know, not necessarily taking a leadership role, but actively working with the team and being engaged and and wanting to get the most out of that experience. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that also, if, if you can't like speak to your contribution to the project, mm -hmm. like you won't get a ton of value from it. And, and one thing, if you're sort of applying for jobs um, and prepping for interviews sort of concurrently with that volunteer project, you should be, you know, and I didn't do this as well as I could, um, but you should be thinking of like moments where your group came to a decision um, or, you know, if your group has a disagreement on the best way to implement a certain solution, that's like a great example to bring into an interview because every interviewer is pretty much going to ask you, you know, like, uh, tell me about a time when, you know, <laughs> you disagree with a teammate or like you had conflict and how, how you've resolved that conflict or, or mm -hmm. some general sort of questions. And if you can answer those questions with an actual Salesforce example, because a lot of us can probably draw on like past experience from other jobs that aren't Salesforce related, which is totally fine. And like, you can tell that story also, mm -hmm. but if you can tell that story also bring in, oh, I worked on this team on the Salesforce implementation, that makes it even more relevant and more powerful. So as you're going through that project, you should be looking for those sorts of opportunities to be like, oh, maybe I should take you know, jot this down so that as I'm prepping for interviews, I remember to bring this up, stuff yeah. like that. Yep. That's exactly right. Um, so let's, let's jump into interviewing now because I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, interviews and in any key takeaways. And I've heard a lot of takeaways already. You've talked about things like uh, using that volunteer experience to feed the conversation and in interviews, 
um, using the work that you're going to do on the, the, the work you've done on the project in your volunteer project, as well as the work you foresee happening in the future, using that to build your resume, to give conversation uh, topics, uh, trying to highlight stories, um, challenges you've overcome, uh, communication issues on your project, uh, maybe things that didn't have a clear solution and the team was at a disagreement on and how you came to a resolution on that. And it's so important to recall those stories and have them ready. Um, and I'll say one more thing and I'll, I'll, I'll let you talk, Nick, cause this is about you. Um, is the, uh, another thing I've noticed that is something I'm not sure if I've shared yet, but as you're going through interviews, as Nick mentioned before, there's going to be a few rounds, you know, some, some people do one or two rounds, you know, maybe for a small company. And they, they get pushed through because they're trying to hire quickly. Typically, you're looking at three to four rounds of interviews um, for, for most companies. And five rounds. Five, right. And so, got rejected from that company, by the way. Okay. I'm a little bitter about it. <laughs> I actually didn't even get rejected. I actually never heard from them. Right. So I'm a little salty about it. Okay. That's okay. Right. It worked out. Yeah, that's rough. <laughs> um, no, it did work out, but that is rough. Um, but it's important to take notes uh, if not during the interview, right after the interview, if they're talking about pain points of the company or why they need a new person, um, why they're adding to the team, why they're replacing someone, uh, what the company's struggling with, um, all the different players, who they are, what role they play, who you've been introduced to, all those things matter. Um, and the reason they matter is because when you get to interview number three or you know, hopefully not, but number five, yeah. um, and they're asking you questions or there's conversations that are coming up, you understand the perspective of who's asking you that question because you know what role they play. Maybe you've talked to them before. Um, maybe you understand the needs of the business in a way from talking to someone else that you can help talk to the points that you know they're asking about. So just keep that in mind as you're going through. Just because an interview is over doesn't mean it's over. You need to use that to build on the next interview. Um, so. And and even, yeah, yeah. Just, even just remembering their names, which is yeah. like really silly, but like, it's, huge. it's like, oh, that. Oh, the last person I interviewed with, we had a really good conversation. It's like, no, like, oh, I interviewed with like Tim and we talked about like these things and, you know, we had a really great conversation. Like this was the feedback he gave me and blah, 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 blah. But like being able to confidently and fluently reference the previous conversations you had, like, you know, brings you up a notch in your level of engagement and commitment to the process. It, it absolutely does. I absolutely notice when I get off the phone call, when I get off a call with somebody, and they finish the conversation by saying, you know, it was really good to talk to you, Brad, or, you know, it means a, there's a little piece there where I go, Hey, I appreciate that. Um, you know, my name when you get off and you know yourself when you get off the phone and you're the person saying like, Hey, it was really good speaking with you, man. Um, like, <laughs> you know, you forgot their name and you feel bad about it. So it's going to make an impact. Um, so yeah. Do, do you have any, uh, you know, tips, strategies, advice from your interview process that you feel uh, others could learn from? I mean, it's it's just com telling a compelling story about yourself. Like other people are going to have um, similar job experience or similar or greater Salesforce experience, but how you frame your experience and how you tell the story about yourself, um, that's what's going to make you unique. So like I led every interview with, yeah, I'm a letter carrier for the post office. And without fail, I was like, what? Like, you're what now? Um, I had to explain to one person, he asked, um, and I had to clarify, no, like, I'm literally the person that goes up to your door and delivers your mail. That's my job right now. Mm -hmm. And people found that pretty compelling. And I still tell that story. Um, it, and it always gets like, like a head, yes. you know, yeah, double take. Um, so find whatever that that is about yourself mm -hmm. um, and really, really lean into it. Um, yeah. And then the other general interview advice I would give is for um, not necessarily more technical interviews, but for more um, case study sort of interviews, um, look up, you know, an agile framework or some project management framework, because in those style of in, in that style of interview, they're looking to see what your critical thinking skills are and how you would approach a problem. Mm -hmm. And spoiler, like a huge amount of the companies in the that implement Salesforce, they all using agile methodology. So if you can sort of sprinkle that in in how you approach problems, 
they're going to immediately know, okay, either this person has either some experience with agile mm -hmm. or they just have a really good head on their shoulders and how they approach um, a challenge or a, a difficult situation. So yeah. those are two sorts of pretty general advice that I would give. Yeah, very true. And I'll, I'll piggyback on the agile methodology thing because it, it is true, especially with consulting firms, they're, they're yeah. almost all using agile functionality. Yeah. I think they might actually all be, um, <laughs> and we, we are looking out for you. So we do have, um, some new speakers coming on for live events in the next couple of months that are going to do some agile sessions. Um, so trust me, I went into consulting and people would say, uh, what have you used in the past, agile or waterfall methodologies? And I had no idea what they were talking about. So don't feel insecure if you have no idea what we're talking about right now. Um, you likely shouldn't unless you've been in project management or consulting work or something like that in the past. And that's the whole purpose of this is is picking up on those things and, and better understanding it. So any any last minute, you know, last things you want to say or you, you wanted to get out there from your experience or strategies or tips that you have for the members? Um, otherwise, I think we actually made it through the whole process and we only went over by three minutes. Pretty good stuff. Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I didn't come prepared with any closing remarks. I will just <laughs> Do you say- you have any to collateral? <laughs> no, I have no collateral. I have no show and tell. Um, I will say to everyone, you know, just- stick to the program, go at your own pace. Um, you know, it, it works. It might happen in four months or six months or eight months. Like it just, it depends on the speed you go and the luck you have, frankly, like luck plays a role in this. Um, so just stick with it. And I, you know, ev everyone or substantially everyone, if you put in the work and you follow the program, you'll, you'll get there. So. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking your time out on the Saturday. Yeah. Um, thanks to the almost 30 people who hung out and uh, spent their Saturday evening. And then of course, to all of you watching this after the fact, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to leave any comments. We'll, we'll find them. And uh, yeah, thanks so much, Nick, for, for doing this for us. And I, I, I really appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Have a awesome. great night. Thanks everybody. Bye.